Hey everyone, and welcome to Southern War, a podcast about the Southern theater of the American Revolution. I'm Ranger William from Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. And I'm Ranger Adrian from 96 National Historic Site. Together, we will explore some of the well-known and not-so-known stories from the American Revolution here in the American South. Time to dive in. So today we're joined by Walt Young from Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie National Historical Park. Thanks so much for joining us, Walt. Absolutely. I'm very happy to be here to talk about the Battle of Sullivan's Island. This is exciting. For those who are unfamiliar, this is one of those first big patriot victories in the American Revolution in the South, uh, where you see the British Navy involved. Uh, really excited to dive into this. But before we get into our story about the Battle of uh, Sullivan's Island and Fort Sullivan, let's talk about you, Walt. So uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your experience there at Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie. Yes, indeed. So I have been a park ranger for parts of seven years in total with the National Park Service, and I'm on year two with Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie. So in addition to talking about the beginning of the Civil War, um, we have a lot of Revolutionary War history here in Charleston, uh, particularly on Sullivan's Island. Um, and I'm excited to talk about that. And I've learned learned more about it over the last two years and have been happy to learn about the kind of the challenges facing ordinary Charlestonians as well as what this famous battle would have uh, would have entailed. And that's something I was kind of curious about, because when most people hear about places like Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie National Historical Park, they're going to kind of be more familiar maybe with the Fort Sumter aspect with the American Civil War of the 1860s. Uh, do you find it challenging to kind of make visitors realize and understand the, the layers of history that you have there at the forts? To some extent, yes. Uh, definitely people know what they're coming for more with Fort Sumter, as you, as you guessed. Um, but when, I, when people walk into Fort Moultrie every day, I have like kind of three or four big points that I try and run through with them, including the Revolutionary War battle and in addition to the Civil War history. But it's definitely a challenge and it's definitely a challenge to kind of narrow down how much you're talking about as opposed to wanting to get everything at the same time, um, which is tempting for me as a ranger, but is maybe learning about stuff in bite-sized pieces is how most of the public learns. Giving drinks from a straw instead of a fire hose, right? Yes. And yes, the fire hose can be tempting. And I I think my park does a good job at making me slow down and uh, and make, and having having people understand it in a more understandable way. Very cool. Um, so to kind of start us off, we've, we've been mentioning Charleston a little bit. Um, so that is the location of this fort, of this action. Um, but specifically looking at Fort Sullivan, can you tell us a little bit more about where is that located? Not only now, but how would this area, this location have been known in 1776? All right. So Fort Moultrie is near the western end of Sullivan's Island. Um, so if you're visualizing Charleston, even in an audio format without a map in front of you, picture the peninsula of Charleston and then picture an island southeast of that at the entrance to Charleston Harbor. This is Sullivan's Island. Um, it had been named after a local basically gadfly named Florence O'Sullivan uh, many years before the revolution. Um, Fort Moultrie is going to be at a point near the western end of this island where it can control the entrance into Charleston Harbor. Um, and that's very important for today's story. That It is not in the city, but it's at the entrance point to protect the city. Today, you can come to this site as well. You just won't be seeing the original Fort Sullivan. Uh, you'll be seeing a fort basically on an overlapping footprint that was built in 1809. Um, so it's the same about place, uh, three miles plus away from Charleston on Sullivan's Island. So we've talked a little bit about how this can control the entrance to the harbor. Um, is that the only reason that this is being built here? Kind of what is the event? What is the reason leading up to the construction and then defense of the fort in the summer of 1776? Well, in the year and a half before this, uh, Charleston has begun to be a center of revolutionary activity. Um, so at the time, it is the capital of South Carolina, um, which so it's a governmental seat of power that both the colonists and the British are going to want to hold. 
Um, and after uh, in the years before the revolution, like many uh, like other places, it had protests over the Stamp Act and Tea Act. It had a little Charleston Tea Party. Uh, seriously, although I think they took their tea home instead of throwing it in the harbor. But instead of uh, after Lexington and Concord and what we consider the start of the American Revolution, there are going to be kind of mini revolutions happening all up and down the American coastline in different areas. And South Carolina is going to be one of those areas. I mean, you have a, a, a one of your parks up near 96 uh, National Historic Site. You've got a you've got a battle there in late 75. Um, and there is real question over whether South Carolina could become a potentially independent state. Here in Charleston, we have a pro provincial Congress that is the governing body of the colony, um, and it will adopt its own constitution in March of 1776. Um, so that is before the nationwide declaration of independence. South Carolina has made a move that would indicate that it could be an independence, maybe a country, maybe a new state. We don't really know yet, um, but that is going to be vital to whether or not uh, there's going to be a revolution here or not. And the British are trying to make sure that there's not. So their goal in sending a large fleet down this way in early 1776 is to establish bases in Charleston and elsewhere and recruit some Southern loyalists to fight alongside them. So they think we can take back Charleston, we can hit the heart of the revolutionary fervor here in South Carolina, and then we can take advantage of loyal the loyalist population elsewhere uh, in order to have a successful campaign here down south. Um, one of the people along with them on this voyage is going to be the former royal governor of the state, uh, William Campbell, who is going to say, uh, be quoted in a letter, that every rebellious measure which has been adopted in this part of the continent originated in Charlestown, is the fountainhead from whence all the violence flows. So if we can take Charleston, say the British, then we can lock down the most rebellious area in the South, and then we can start taking places where people uh, agree with us from there. That's a great quote from the governor. I love that. Mm -hmm. So this fleet is sailing South. What do we know about the history of, of the fort? Like had there previously been any fortifications attempted out there on Sullivan's Island to control the Harbor, or is this the first time mm -hmm. that there's being something built? There had not really been fortifications before this on Sullivan's Island. And one thing I neglected to mention in the section about what Sullivan's Island is, is that the main governmental function it had been used for before this um, is unfortunately uh, quarantine houses uh, for largely victims of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so up until late 1775, you've got uh, people uh, in huge numbers being brought into South Carolina on uh, against their will on the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and think of Ellis Island in New York as a kind of quarantine site for immigrants who want to come here. Um, this is uh, an importation site for immigrants who might not want to come through here and might be carrying a lot of nasty diseases. Um, so there was nothing, uh, The there was only those buildings here uh, until late 1775, um, and they actually get destroyed in late 1775. So they're uh, the first kind of colonial activity here is going to be um, the like, a group of enslaved workers trying to basically get to that island. And it seems weird that they would be running toward a quarantine site, um, but they're hoping that the British uh, that British ships can pick them up in late 75. Um, and the colonists will want to, one, prevent the British from making a landing here in late 75, um, and two, for many of them, get those enslaved workers back. Um, so they are going to do prevent that from happening, um, and then establish a foothold on that island. After that has happened, the colonists will now have Sullivan's Island rather than the British, and they can start using it as a site for uh, a site for building a fort. And like I mentioned earlier, it's a strategically important site on the way into the harbor. So the colonists are going to want to start building a fort there, and they're going to do so beginning in January of 1776. They're authorized by the local legislature. Um, they're under the command of a man named William Moultrie. So you'll, you'll hear this sometimes referred to as Fort Moultrie. He didn't name it after himself at that time, uh, but he is the first commander of the fort. Um, and they will start working in 1770, January 1776 with work from both colonists, militiamen, and enslaved workers. That was great. Thank you for sharing all that, the yeah. role that this island had and the layers of history there. So 
super yeah, it's a, it, I mean, it's a very sad story, but it's, I mean, for millions of people, we estimate that hundreds of thousands came in on the slave trade to Charleston specifically. Um, so, yeah, if, if we don't talk about that. We're leaving out a huge portion of what makes this island important. So you've introduced already our one of the big players here with Colonel William Moultrie and the location and the reason of building the fortification. Um, can you tell us some other kind of key players who are going to be involved in this story and what is going to be built? Like, what are they going to construct with Fort Sullivan? Yep. Um, so a couple couple of the other key players on the Patriot side, um, besides William Moultrie, are going to include a man named William Thompson, um, but he's also known for his nickname of Danger Thompson. So you want that guy on your side in the battle. Um, he's going to be largely commanding Patriot forces on the opposite end of Sullivan's Island, and we'll get to that why that's important uh, in a few minutes. Um, another Patriot who's going to be interesting uh, an interesting part of the story is a man named Charles Lee. Um, who is from uh, coming down from the Continental Army, um, and he's basically going to be the advisor from the Continental Army uh, to the defense of this city. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, he's he's a controversial character, so we'll talk about his opinions on the fort in a few minutes. Uh, on the British side, uh, we've got uh, Henry Clinton, who we, uh, many listeners will know as one of the foremost British generals of the Revolution. Um, and commanding the naval forces is going to be a man named Admiral Peter Parker, not Spider-Man. Uh, and I can prove it because he has one of those aristocratic British wigs. He does not look like Spider-Man. Um, but he is going to be commanding the British fleet to try and get into this harbor. So colonists and the enslaved workers will begin building in January. And they are going to have a couple of building materials uh, that are going to be crucial to the success of this sport. Uh, the main structure is going to be palmetto logs. So the palmetto trees that are commonly found on coastal islands here in South Carolina are going to be the wood for this fort. Um, you've also got a natural adhesive in vast quantities on the beach in sand. Um, so it's palmetto log and sand fort uh, to hold it together. Um, and it'll be under construction. It's partially finished five months in by the time the British are about to show up and attack. Um, it's no worth noting that Charles Lee uh, the continental uh, advisor to this uh, to the Patriots here is going to think that this fort is horrible. Uh, he's going to look around and he's going to say that this is a slaughter pen in the making. And he's going to recommend that the Patriots abandon this strategic location and just move back to downtown Charleston and focus on defending the bottom of the city. Um, whether his whether or not his plan would have been the more successful, uh, I think will be uh, be evident as we move on through the program. Um, but there are some people in very high places with serious doubts about whether the sport is going to be able to successfully defend. And that brings us right up to the moment of action here. What is going to happen? When will this unfinished slaughter pen be tested? Why was the fort's defense so successful? So a couple of reasons. The British are going to show up at the beginning of the month of June 1776. And they are going to end up putting their plans into action in the later part of the month, primarily on the day June 28th, 1776. Um, so I always ask my visitors, and I can ask you uh, since we're here, um, who has home field advantage in this conflict? Is it going to be the British or the colonists? The British. It is going to be a coastal naval action, and Britannia mm -hmm. rules the waves. That is an, uh, that is an interesting perspective. But I would go for the colonists because they know the specific inlets around here, whereas the British have primarily good naval power uh, just in general. So the British are going to have to plan for knowing the, ter the specific terrain entering this harbor. And they're going to make a couple of plans for attacking this fort. Plan, uh, plan number 1A is to get ships in through the main part of the harbor to go from the main shipping channel of Charleston Harbor, which is just south of Sullivan's Island, past the unfinished fort, uh, take it out, and then get into the city of Charleston and uh, conquer that. Uh, so that's plan 1A. I would say plan 1B is going to be actually a land attack. So they are going to land forces. Uh, over on what we call Long Island. Uh, nowadays, we call it Isle of Palms for uh, tourist and uh, Airbnb purposes. Um, but Long Island is going to be an island up from Sullivan's. And if we, if the Brits can hit the fort with artillery from the sea and then make a land attack 
uh, and land on the northern end of the island and get uh, hit the unfinished fort from the back, then they can squeeze it and they can win the battle that way, they think. Um, out of those two, uh, two ideas, how many of them do you think work? Well, I mean, when you're looking at our history and we kind of know that we win the battle, trying to trying to forget about that, I think both of these have a lot of merits. Like you said, with your home court advantage, of course, the British maybe don't know all the inlets, so maybe that's going to throw a problem into the naval assault. But, you know, you have the British Navy landing troops elsewhere during the war, successfully landing troops. So... Mm -hmm. I'm trying to forget that I know the history of it. Let's go with the the land assault's going to be successful. Uh, there's a and there, there's a decent case to be made that they had they had reason to believe that it could be successful going in. Um, but the answer ultimately is surprisingly going to be zero. Um, so the British are going to make some strategic error and uh, intelligence errors. One of them is that they think that Breach Inlet, which connects these two islands or separates them rather, is shallow and easy to cross, and that does not end up being the case. Um, they are going to run into a seven foot deep inlet, even at low tide, um, which is going to be very difficult to cross. And they're going to have to try a boat landing. They are going to be turned back by that colonial force under William Danger Thompson uh, at that end of the island. So that plan is not going to play a major part in the fighting at Fort, Mo uh, Fort Sullivan itself. Um, and there that force is basically taken out of the battle. Problem number two they're going to come across is that they think that this channel is going to be fairly deep and wide, um, about 20 feet deep at its deepest, which is correct. Um, but they run into the problem that it's not nearly as wide as they think. Um, and so not, uh, of their nine warships they're trying to sail in the harbor, three of them will run aground on the future site of Fort Sumter, uh, which has not been built yet, but is then just a sandbar. So they are going to run aground and be basically taken out of the battle. The remaining six will not make a move to move toward Charleston very quickly. Instead, they are focusing all their fire, basically sitting in front of Fort Sullivan and firing on it for the better part of the day of June 28th. Um, they have The British have about 262 cannons on their ships, and the colonists inside the fort have 31, um, which is more than a 9 to 1 ratio. Um, and yet, by the end of the battle, another... Uh, another thing that will prove pretty important is the building materials of these vessels versus the building materials of the fort. The spongy palmetto logs will manage to withstand a lot of that British attack, whereas even facing far fewer numbers of bullets, the British, with their more brittle wooden ships, better for seafaring, will take a lot more damage, uh, and their ships are going to be pretty cut up by the end of the battle. Uh, ultimately, I'd say that it's a combination of British, maybe strategic mistakes and the colonists' better structural materials that help the colonists win a very unexpected victory. Now, when I was looking into a little bit about this uh, this story, isn't it some kind of crazy ratio? Uh, not just you mentioned the, hmm. the dichotomy and the number of guns, but the number of shots fired. I came across somewhere that it was like for every one shot fired by the fort's defenders, the British fired 50 at the fortification. I, I, I have seen the 50 to one number as well. And I it, I think it is pretty remarkable that, that because the colonists are basically holding back fire. It's mentioned throughout the battle uh, and they are trying to not take shots until they know that they're going to hit something. It does help that the British get their ships very close to the shoreline um, and are within pretty easy cannon range of the colonists. Um, and so that the, those colonial bullets do pack a punch um, as opposed to fairly ineffective British cannon fire. Um, so, yes, it's it's a truly remarkable victory in several ways. Now, in another place, I was reading that the uh, that uh, Commodore Parker was wanting to bring his fleet closer so that they would have more destructive energy, more uh, momentum behind the shot to try and break mm -hmm. through the Palmettos. But it was mm -hmm. actually his local pilot. Um, who was afraid of the shots coming from the fort, both the the cannon fire as well as the musket and rifle shot, mm -hmm. and uh, refused to direct or kind of guide the vessels closer mm -hmm. and kept them farther away. Have you seen or come across this anywhere? Well, I will. Uh, I don't know about the later part of that story in that um, I haven't seen that specific note, but I would mention that the local pilot might have been on something in that 
the harbor is not as wide as Parker believed. Like as you get closer to Sullivan's Island, it is not still 20 feet deep directly next to that island. It's basically it's a relatively narrow channel that snakes through the harbor. The pilots, who largely would have been either enslaved African Americans or now freedmen, um, are going to give Parker a few pieces of intelligence um, that it, it, it at some point it's kind of what you do with them. Uh, what you do with the piece of intelligence that matters. And I get the sense that he did not make full use of he, uh, what intelligence resources he had. Um, so I would say that he didn't come right. He came fairly close, but not right next to the fort. Um, and if he had done that, he might have hit some sand on the opposite side as the place that he did. Now, do we have any idea about how close the uh, the vessels were when they were engaging with Fort Moultrie? Um, we've seen uh, the the channel is about from Moultrie to the place where the um, where the British ships would have run aground. That's only about a mile. And the main channel is within about the quarter mile to three quarter mile range. So I'm going to say that on average, they were about half a mile away from the colonists position. Um, and that would have even then been well within cannon range uh, to get a shot across. Interesting. All right. So what are some of the common questions or misconceptions that visitors might have when they hear the story of Fort Moultrie or when they visit you? Um, so a couple of things that I would mention. Uh, one is uh, some people will come and ask, uh, well, where's the Palmetto Log Fort? Uh, and the answer <laughs> is that it is no longer here. Uh, so some people come expecting it if they've heard a little bit about the battle. Um, and what they generally find is that the fort withstood those British cannonballs, um, but didn't did not survive a couple large hurricanes, which are a fact of life over here in the Low Country. Yeah. Um, so that uh, the current fort that we've got today is an 1809 fort that is the third version of Fort Moultrie, and it is made out it, it is largely a brick fort. Um, it would have been used starting in the pre war of 1812 era. And it's what fought in the Civil War and fought uh, even in even a bit in World War II. Um, so we have a little confusion about what our site is currently today preserving. Um, I think there's also a, like because of, for example, the Palmetto flat, uh, the Palmetto tree and Crescent Moon ending up on the South Carolina state flag. Um, that has ended up being a. Uh, Almost a misconception in itself that the Palmetto Logs are the only reason that the Patriots won the battle. Um, and I would say that the the British uh, conflicts in planning and consistent delays and ultimately their uh, failed plans of attack uh, are going to make a significant difference uh, in the colonists winning the battle. I think that the colonists ended up having better planning than the British did. And I think uh, we can't put it all down to the structure we have to give a little credit to uh to the people involved as well um the also beat themselves okay, in a way <laughs> yes i oh i definitely think the british beat themselves um there's also occasional confusion between sumter and moultrie um partic uh, most people uh going to moultrie don't have this mistake but um when some people come to fort sumter and ask about the first shots of the civil war uh i've i've heard questions of oh like well, so what role did the Palmetto Logs play in the battle? Um, and the answer that is that they didn't in that battle. They played a role in the 1776 battle. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say little things, but I, I would say those are a few of the misconceptions. Uh, the um, There is a, a, a cool kind of controversy over the South Carolina state flag that I could mention. Um, I'm guessing you and your listeners are probably familiar with the flag with the dark blue background, the Palmetto tree in the middle, and the crescent in the corner. Um, the palmetto, uh, the symbols are, in fact, because of the 1776 battle. Um, the palmetto tree uh, got added to many South Carolina related flags uh, in the years after uh, the Revolutionary War and was added to the state flag in 1861 by the Confederacy. Um, but it's intended to be a symbol of resilience that the uh, colonists had managed to turn back the British Royal Navy using these palmetto uh, logs. The crescent, uh, people argue about it all the time. Uh, some some people will say that it is a, a gorget, like the neck brace, um, that many medieval soldiers would have worn against potential attacks to their throat area. 
Um, one of uh, one author, uh, local author with a good book about William Moultrie has argued, and I tend to take this position as well, um, that it comes from Moultrie's crest, um, that many, uh, many second sons of uh, families like himself would have had a crescent like symbol on their crest. Um, and so the, the, he argues that that's the main reason he did as well. Um, and they would have flown that crescent during the battle here at uh, Fort Sullivan. Cool. All right. So after the battle, what happens? What's what does it affect the American Revolution, especially in the South? So I would say a couple things. One, um, in terms of how it impacts the South, um, it really damages the. It is a complete failure for the first major British attempt to take uh, the Southern colonies of uh, the future U.S. Um, and so it basically, like the war, moves away from the South for. The next couple of years, really, you have a lot. You still have patriot and lo versus loyalist fighting um, in places like North Carolina and uh, el elsewhere. Um, but much of the uh, the regular British army is going to be have a limited presence in the South until let's say late 1778, um, before they start to move towards Savannah and Charleston again. Um, so this really does buy Charleston a lease on life for being independent from the British um, for what will end up being another four years. Um, a symbolic impact that it's going to have. Um, it does not cause this, but it lines up pretty well symbolically with our Declaration of Independence. So this is this battle happens June 28th of 1776. That's just about a week before the uh, final uh, I's are dotted and T's are crossed on the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia. Um, of course, William Moultrie couldn't have gotten on his uh, mobile phone to Thomas Jefferson and John Adams to say we won the battle. You can finished writing now, um, but they were able to get word up there by the time you get to early August, which is when everyone's finished signing the document. Um, so it could have been a limited, it could have been a kind of morale defeat right around the time of the signing of the declaration that, oh man, the Br British are able to start cutting into our territory and we haven't even begun being a country yet. Um, but uh, it ends up being a morale victory that the most powerful Navy in the world has now been, at least today, vanquished uh, by some ragtag militias and their palmetto logs. Um, so I would say in addition to the uh, the strategic impact, it also does have a uh, kind of morale impact on the rest of the country and and the war effort. Yeah, that's, that's true. I haven't even thought about that. Now, when it comes to kind of the complexity of the stories and some of the layers of the stories that you've been sharing with us, um, do you have one that is kind of your favorite topic or an untold or lesser known story related to the fort's defense? All right, so my favorite uh, so my favorite story about 1776 in itself um, is a pretty well-known one around here, but it's about a man named Sergeant William Jasper, um, who during the battle, uh, the uh, while the British don't do that much damage to the palmetto logs, uh, they do manage to hit with a cannonball uh, the flagpole um for the patriot flag which would have been that dark blue field and just the crescent no tree on it um so as it topples to the ground uh that is one kind of uh, again with morale potential morale boost for the british and potential morale downer for the americans uh that their flag has been cut down um sergeant william jasper uh is going to save the flag he is going to manage to get it back up and the way he does it is he tie he ties the remnants of the flagpole to what we would call a sponge rammer or a sponge staff, which is what they usually would have been using to clean their cannons. Um, so I think it's a, a moment of both uh, creativity uh, and bravery getting up on ramparts uh, uh, with cannonballs potentially flying at you uh, to manage uh, manage to get the flag back up uh, and restore a uh, a moment's victory to your own side in the midst of this battle. Um, so I think that's my favorite in inside that. I also do want to touch on a little bit of Charleston during the war, uh, the rest of the war, um, because beyond this one day, it's a very interesting place to live. And I would encourage people to uh, learn more about it. I'll, uh, I'll mention a couple of books in a few minutes um, on what's life like in Charleston as the revolution goes on. Um, early in the war, uh, we already mentioned the late 1775 uh, attempt to escape for many uh, many enslaved workers around the area, um, and 
uh, the uncomfortable truth kind of for us with our uh, glad we're a country today. Um, but the uncomfortable truth for many of us is that for some people, uh, the British might have been uh, seen as a better option. That if you were enslaved in the area and your owner was a patriot, uh, then you might want to escape the British lines uh, and b potentially become free. And for some people, the, uh, the British aren't going to be all consistent on that regard. Uh, but they are going to honor that freedom uh, for some people. So it's something we need to acknowledge. Um, later in the war, uh, the British do, and here's the very little secret after we've talked about this amazing victory for an hour. Um, the British captured Charleston in 1780. Don't, don't tell your listeners. Um, because they managed to, uh, this time, get past the fort um, and also have a land invasion from the north. So they... Learned their lesson from the first time. They focused on invading from the north of Charleston, up from Savannah, and they um, they managed to basically just send their fleet right by the fort and not engage in battle. Once that happens, and once the British take over Charleston for about their last two and a half, three years of the revolution, you've got a, you've got a real devil's choice if you're an ordinary citizen of this city on who you think is going to win the revolution and who you're going to tie your horse to. Um, you've got the, the uh, maybe the worry of getting your land taken away uh, if you pick the wrong side. So under British occupation, the patriots are going to get their land taken away sometimes. And under renewed patriot occupation, the loyalists are going to get their land taken away. Um, so you've really got a, uh, a difficult choice uh, in terms of what you need to do to stay on the right side of whoever's in charge now in uh, Revolutionary War Charleston. You even get dueling loyalty oaths. Um, the British, by the end of the war, have a tension between recruiting some of these black soldiers and protecting the property of slave-owning loyalists uh, as well. Um, so it really is a tangled web and an interesting topic uh, for listeners to learn more about is what life would have been like in an occupied city here during the American Revolution. Maybe we could do an episode on that sometime later, Will. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, we're definitely going to circle for back around for the uh, the 1780 siege story. For uh, sure. Yeah. Two siege. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely. So, yeah, don't worry, Will. We got you. We, we, we got would you. love to be back on. So. We're coming back around. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some sources that people can find in their libraries, find in the bookstores somewhere to learn more? Sure. Um, my personal favorite book about uh, the this battle, um, and it's kind of a biography of a man who led it for the Americans, is called Crescent Moon Over Carolina um, by C.L. Bragg. Um, so it, it's a it, it's a good biography of William Moultrie himself, um, and it goes into pretty good detail about uh, this Battle of Sullivan's Island. Um, definitely encourage people to read that. Um, I've also been, um, there's, a, uh, regarding the later war stuff, there's been a, a report by a woman named Christina Butler, um, who, uh, along with some others, wrote a book, report on British occupied Charleston from 1780 to 1782. Um, her husband, Nick Butler, is a historian at the uh, Charleston County Public Library uh, and runs an excellent podcast and blog called the Charleston Time Machine, um, which can give you some really good, like really boiled down uh, summaries of some of these important Revolutionary War events uh, and other stuff that was happening on Sullivan's Island and beyond. Um, you can also come to our programs uh, at Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie National Historical Park. Uh, I don't know what time of year this will come out yet, but uh, we hold an annual uh, commemoration for Carolina Day, which is a weekend surrounding June 28th each year. Carolina Day is what people in South Carolina now call uh, the date of the Battle of Sullivan's Island. Um, and we are happy to talk, uh, talk about that. We have artillery and musket firing demonstrations uh, and uh, living historians in to let people understand what goes on here at this uh, what goes on here at this place in 1776. Awesome. All right. Well, that's going to conclude another episode of A Southern War, a podcast about the Southern theater of the American Revolution. To learn more about the American Revolution and our home national park sites, check out www.nps.gov slash NISI for me, Ranger Adrian, at 96 National Historic Site. 
and www.nps.gov slash OVVI for Ranger Will with the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. And you can check out is www.nps.gov slash FOSU for Fort Moultrie and Fort Sumter. Um, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed and we'll see you next time when we revisit the Southern Theater of the American Revolution. All right. Bye. Bye.